Hello, I'm Lainey. I'm Casey. Sarah. Molly. And we are going to be talking about human modified landscapes altering the home range and movement patterns of capybara. So the introduction of this paper was stating that humans are changing natural animal habitats, which everybody knows that. We don't need to elaborate on that, obviously, with infrastructure, with um, housing developments, um, fragmentation of forests, isolation of habitats. We're, we're doing terrible things to our poor little animals. And this can cause dietary changes as a result to different animal species. So in this case, talking about capybara, they are switching from C3 plants to C4 plants, which C3 plants are just like your trees and your shrubs and your natural foliage. And C4 plants are more of your agricultural crops and like wheat and that kind of stuff. And it can also be causing displacement from home range because these animals are traveling to different places that they wouldn't normally be going to in order to find food. And they can also change their feeding times based on human modification of their habitats and the activity of humans in certain areas at different times. So as I pretty much just said, wildlife and um, human in infrastructure has increased globally, but in different ways. So common conflicts between um, humans and animals is crop rating, as you can see. I mean, this looks like they put out some food for them. But crop rating is when wildlife will go into a farmer's crops and just eat a bunch of food and then head out. Livestock predation can be caused by like coyotes and wolves moving into humans um, areas and like eating chickens or something at a farm. Vehicle collisions are increasing rapidly as we have these misplaced animals in different places that humans are traveling. They can be hit during the day, during the morning, during the night when they're usually traveling or if they're disturbed at other times. And then transmission of zoonotic diseases is also increasing as humans are coming into contact with these animals or like a raccoon with rabies might travel through your backyard and your dog might try to go after it. So we have a lot of these problems are increasing as we are taking over the natural habitat of wildlife. So the study focused mainly on capybaras, which their scientific name is Hydrochorus Hydrocaris, definitely butchered that, um, but they are known as super abundant herd animals. So usually there's 50 or more per herd and they are very, very abundant in Brazil. And researchers have hypothesized that one of the reasons that there's a high availability, one of the reasons that there's so many capybaras is that there's a high availability of high energy foods, such as sugarcane and corn and cultivated grass. And there's also low predation risks whenever you have a lot of humans around. So they hypothesized in this study that capybaras are going to change home ranges, ranging patterns and activity in human modified landscapes in contrast to non-modified landscapes. They also further predicted on top of that that capybaras respond to human influence by using a smaller home range and moving less overall. And they also predicted that movement during the day would be reduced. And then this fun little graph right here just summarizes exactly what I said. So HML is human modified landscapes and then NL is natural landscapes. So you can see that the human modified landscapes, they're gonna have a lower home range and then natural landscapes, a higher home range. And then ranging patterns over here that in human modified landscapes during the day, they're going to not come out as much. They're gonna be out more at night. And then in human modified landscapes, pretty much saying the exact same thing here, that they're gonna be out a lot more during the night than in a non-modified landscape. Okay, so yeah, so when they started their study, um, they decided to do two natural landscape areas and then uh, six different human modified locations, which are kind of posted off there on the graph on the left. Um, the natural land cover is in the greenish color and then the human modified land cover is more in the red. So as you can see, that top one has a lot more red, the bottom one has a lot more green. Um, and so then they conducted it in Brazil uh, with areas that are including Sa uh, Sao Paulo, Araras, and Piria Sicaba. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so they identified the different landscapes by the, how open the area was. So the natural habitats were more lowland open areas with more available water to the capybaras. 
and then the human modified landscapes, as previously said, with the HML, uh, are more isolated and disconnected forest remnants. So that's, as, she, uh, as Lainey was talking about, it's more fragmented, so it's going to be separated a lot more with the forests and their food. Um, and then they wrote down descriptions of each location, which is the next. This is a picture of some of the documentation that they did. So they did the study area, so like where it was located, the location based off of longitude and latitude, um, and then they did the anthropic features, so basically what the area looked like, what was around it, so like this one said like road and fence and the urban area, whereas like some of the other ones are like, like artificial water reservoir uh, and all that kind of stuff. And then the natural features compared to the anthropic features, if there was more of them, so these top two were the natural landscapes, the bottom six are the human modified. And then the water body that use, is used by the capybaras, and then the group size of the capybaras that they viewed it there. So then continuing on, so for the data collection, they specifically were looking at a uh, group size, which um, was estimated to be about 100 capybaras in total over all eight different landscape areas. Um, they then, to collect their data, they would capture the capybaras in corrals, and they were they baited them with like sugarcane, green corn, and then banana tree leaf, um, or some of the other ones, depending on the location, were uh, shot with CO2 injection rifles to then anesthetize uh, them. Ooh, that word is fun. <laughs> to anesthetize them uh, so that they would like pass out, and so that way they could have them uh, to study. So then they would measure the age, gender, and weight while also implanting microchips, which the microchips were used to identify locations. Um, they found that there was 17 adult capybaras were collared, which was one from each group that they collected. 16 of them were females and one of them was male. And then the collars were, the collars which like the microchips and stuff that we were talking about, uh, were also programmed to collect the positions every one to two hours for the first 30 to 40 days, and then after that 40 day range, they were then collected every four hours and 17 minutes. So this was just like two, um, two, what word am I looking for? Yeah. Two like examples, yeah, sure, that. Examples of like how they did their the data collection. So they had like the number uh, animal that they had, they had their weight in kilograms, the landscape type, so both of these were the natural landscapes, the area that it was taken from, and then the GPS sampling, so the number of days that they were able to find them, and then the number of locations that they were in, where their home range was, and then what their ranging pattern was depending on daytime slash nighttime. So the results, uh, the results are that capybara home range size in the natural landscapes was greater than the human modified landscapes. Um, the result was, uh, it also showed that capybaras walk longer in their natural landscapes than they did in uh, human modified landscapes. This uh, then shows that they would be less active in the human modified landscapes than they would be in the natural. Um, so like they would have, as you can see in this graph, the red is the uh, human modified landscapes and the blue is the natural, their natural landscapes. And so their first like burst of energy for like the human um, modified ones was at, what was that? Um, at around like five in the morning and then uh, then they'd like calm down for a little bit, rest, whatever, you know. And then their next verse would be uh, 1800, <laughs> six o'clock. I don't know military time. Um, <laughs> so then with their uh, natural uh, landscape, they would, it would be, what was it? It'd be pushed back a little, like by an hour. So they would go, their first burst of energy would would be at like six, and then their second one would be at uh, 1500. Uh, and yeah. <laughs> so uh, what we were able to find with this is that the hypothesis is supported. So the care of the capybaras, um, they change their home range, their ranging pattern and activity based on human modified landscapes. Um, so that was proven to be true with the graphs and results that they found. It has a lot of consequences, uh, such as the capybaras then have a smaller range with such a large population. Uh, it creates a lot of interspecies interactions between humans and capybara, such as uh, the capybara encroaching on the humans 
uh, home and things like crops and such like that, and then things on the crops or in the grass like pesticides that the capybaras could consume that would cause them harm. Um, it also makes it so they are less able to um, run and be fit from predators because they're flocking less and they're relaxing more because there are less predators. They start to adapt to that uh, more, uh, I guess, lazy or carefree lifestyle in a human population. So you can see that this is something that's negative for both the humans and the capybara as they go along trying to figure out how to cope uh, habitat. And what it ends up being is a resource battle between the humans and the capybara, where it just naturally is going to be that they're trying to uh, allocate resources and fight for what's best. So the humans are trying to save their yard and their flowers and their fields, and the capybara are trying to uh, eat and survive. And naturally, there's going to be a winner if um, just left to their own devices where someone will win out, and that's naturally would be the humans. Right now, there's no uh, fear of extinction. That's something to watch out for. So this is uh, one of the reasons why humans have to be the ones to take the first step to action, because capybara are just going to keep being capybara, and they're going to do what's best for them. Um, and humans are the only ones that are able to take a conscious uh, effort and decision to make any type of difference. Um, and we, it would be great to study some ways to curb these negative effects, such as uh, figuring out fencing for yards so that um, capybara can't get in and continue to live in their natural habitat, regulating human growth, regulating capybara growth, um, both in healthy ways, and having dedicated areas for the capybara and for the humans. And this all, obviously, all coincides, it all collects to make the overall health of the ecosystem better. And some limitations for the studies is they could have used a larger sampling area because they stayed in kind of one area and it was all in uh, Brazil. And um, they stayed in kind of a concentrated area and they only studied uh, two natural locations but they studied six of the human modified location, so it should have been a better balance there, um, and maybe capture more males, not just female. Um, and some follow-up studies would be great to uh, study resource availability. So are the capybaras coming to the humans modified land on purpose, even though there's plenty of natural land because of the uh, corn, the grass and such? Is there, are we enticing them to come and intermingle with humans, and if so, how can we these are our references for the paper. Uh, thank you for watching and